Hey everybody, what's up? Hello everyone. It's been a minute. How is everybody? Just taking a few minutes. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, earlier today, someone asked me um, for a COVID update and for us to kind of talk about what's happening with stimulus checks and relief and stuff like that. And um, and so I said, yeah, let's do it. I'm happy to hop on uh, Instagram Live tonight and answer your questions around COVID relief and stuff like that. Um, I've also had a lot of people saying, when are you gonna do your cooking Q&A? Um, and I figured I'd do it now. You know, a lot of you have been wondering like why I stopped doing my cooking Instagrams. And frankly, it's because I haven't been doing as much cooking. And when I am, it's like, you know, like sad, like rice and beans. I mean, it's not that's not that sad per se, but um, it's not necessarily the most entertaining thing in the world to watch. It's just like things are slow and boiling. But anyways, um, I wanted to hop on and give you guys an update on COVID and stimulus checks and like what's going on and why is no one helping? <laughs> um, and I want us to talk about like what what the state of play of uh, things are right now, what you can do, um, et cetera. So that's what I'm gonna be doing tonight. Um, I'm also going to try to be taking some of these questions um, while I am making a meal. So I have kind of a salmon cream pasta situation uh, that actually shouldn't take super long to make. Um, so I'm just gonna be doing most of my prep work except mincing the garlic. I did that ahead of time because that takes a long time. Um, but yeah, um, feel free to pop in with your questions. Let me see what you've got here. Um, and let me see what um, some of your questions are. And, and actually, you know what I'll do is that I'll start off, um, before going to questions, I'll just start off on the state of play and how things are going um, with the Senate and just with COVID and are we gonna get stimulus checks? What's gonna happen, et cetera. So here's the deal. Um, everyone's talking about all this fighting going on in DC and honestly, to a certain extent, who cares about the fighting when the point of the whole situation and the um, the end result of all this fighting is that people aren't getting what they need, right? So here's the deal. There's a couple of moving parts. And as you know, we go back to Schoolhouse Rock in order for a bill to become a law, which is what we need to do to get uh, COVID relief in order to pass a stimulus. Um, and for that $1,200 check last time, um, we needed to pass a law for that, right? Because not every form of relief, you know, people may say, oh, that's such a basic thing to say but not every form of relief actually requires passing a law, right? Um, that's our, our whole argument to Joe Biden is that you don't actually need uh, Republican senators to vote for student loan relief, for example. Um, he could cancel student millions and probably billions, frankly, billions of dollars of student loan debt with a strike of his pen, with an executive order. And so the reason why I, so I do think it's important to say and reiterate that in order for us to get COVID relief, unfortunately, um, this is not just a matter of the president just signing an executive order and sending $1,200 stimulus checks out to everybody. We have to pass a law, which means that um, we have to get the house to vote on something. It means that the house has to pass a law. It means the Senate has to, or rather pass a bill. The Senate has to pass a bill and Trump still needs to sign that bill. So he, let's keep it real. Let's keep it, let's talk about beyond just Democrats are this and Republicans are that. Because it's not, this actually is not a situation of every Republican not wanting a check. Uh, this is a situation, this is a matter of Mitch, McC Mitch McConnell not wanting a check. Um, Mitch McConnell does not want to cut checks. And what the big holdup is, and even with Republicans, who are, even with many Republicans who are open to voting for a check, the problem is, is that they want something in exchange, right? And the thing that they want, that Republicans are asking for in exchange is something known as 
li corporate liability protections. What's that? Corporate immunity. And what do corporations want immunity for? A lot of corporations want complete immunity from their workers suing them for putting them in dangerous COVID conditions. So what Mitch McConnell is asking for is, and what he has, what he like originally has demanded is I want corporations, major corporations, like the Amazons of the world that are, you know, whose warehouses we've been hearing Amazon workers have been kind of coming forward and saying that COVID protections are not, um, are, are not as present, that people are packed in much closer than six feet, uh, that we don't know when someone gets tested positive in a facility and they don't really tell us a lot. And so I may have been exposed to COVID, but then I don't know if I should get a test or not because no one's told me anything. Those are worker protections. And, um, or you know, when a company tries to cram a bunch of people in physical space together, but doesn't provide masks or doesn't provide adequate um, protections that are in line with CDC guidelines. So what Mitch McConnell said is that we want to give big corporations total immunity for five years from COVID related lawsuits. Now, if we do that, if we accept that for a one time $1,200 check or a super short expansion of unemployment insurance, the deal is, is that you're going to end up behind because you may get one $1,200 check on one hand, but you may also get a multi-million dollar hospital bill with no recourse and no ability to um, protect yourself from a negligent corporation or employer. And so that's not worth it, right? Your check is not worth your life. And so what we need to do is talk them down from that, right? But let me be very clear that where we're at right now is that some Republicans, and frankly, it's just, I just think it's sad where it's like, why do you need to get something for helping your constituents? Why do you need to, why do we need to exchange people's well-being and ability to survive for yet another corporate bailout after we already, by the way, passed a $4 trillion leveraged fund for Wall Street in March. So let me, so like, let's talk about the math here because y'all got a $1,200 check. Wall Street got 4 trillion in access to liquid funds. And, um, and that to me, just structurally will i i'm i'm concerned what keeps me up at night is that it was short-term relief that was really important and really necessary but that the help for working people and everyday people as we know dries up super fast but what we gave away what we gave away to wall street was so large and so structural that frankly like that's why republicans i think have not been have been you know not as um and why mitch mcconnell has not been in a rush because we because wall street got an enormous bailout and they don't really need uh to be saved with that kind of extension of liquidity um right now and I'm afraid that it kind of disincentivized them to come back to the negotiating table so that we could get more for working people. Whether that's true or not, I still think we have to see um, if that bears out. But personally, that was a concern of mine. And I'm concerned that, that you know, Mitch McConnell, uh, that his lack of urgency around helping people that maybe he would have a little bit more urgency if Wall Street needed help as desperately as working people need help right now. So anyways, fast forward, what does that mean for right now? So we just had our last vote in DC um, this week. We just had our last vote uh, this week um, and today for the week. We are now kind of at an impasse 
and Senate and House leaders are negotiating um, this 900 or so billion dollar package that we hope we can vote on next week. Um, Congress has critical government funding deadlines, you know, when the government shuts down all the time, which it, by the way, it didn't used to shut down all the time. This is kind of a, a modern phenomenon of our government's dysfunction um, that basically when the government shuts down all the time, it's always around now, right? It's always around Christmas time, which is and holiday time. And by the way, happy Hanukkah to all of our, our friends and neighbors that are lighting their first candle tonight. Um, but you know, it's always around this time, frankly, when people need this help the most that our government shuts down. And, um, and so we, we have to come back and make sure that we fund the government next week and that we are in negotiations and making sure that we get this through. Um, but we also need to pass COVID relief. Now, the current $900 package that is being negotiated has tiny unemployment expansion um, to the tune of about $300. So you know how in earlier this year we were able to expand unemployment um, assistance and it was $600? That's way more helpful. You know, the $600 in UI ended up being one of the most effective anti-poverty programs that we have seen in recent history. You know, people were really finally able to just breathe a tiny bit for a short period of time with that expanded UI. And we heard from some folks then that you know, why are you going to do that $600? It's too much money. You're disincentivizing people going back to work. But we could have solved, and in fact, we had proposals to solve that problem so that you didn't have to face this cliff, right? So that if you went back to work, you wouldn't lose money. Um, but at the same time, we could ease people. You could keep that help while you transition back to your job. Um, those proposals were shut, were shut down. Um, and we had many other proposals as well uh, to help ease this issue. And now what's going on is now we have this tiny increase. So we went from that $600 help, the current state of the package that's being negotiated is cut in half. So instead of $600 in unemployment, they're now looking at $300 in unemployment and no stimulus check. Um, is that enough? Is that enough for you? Is that enough for your friends? Is that enough for your family? Is that enough for the people that you know who are struggling right now? $300 UI and no check, is that enough? I don't think so. I don't think that's enough. Um, not only that, but it's also as though Mitch McConnell and all of these folks aren't taking any responsibility for the fact that they allowed unemployment to expire in August. They're not taking any responsibility for the fact that they messed up, that they hurt people back in August. And so when those unemployment protections expired in August, you then had people who were able to, with that little bit of help, able to make their rent, able to you know buy some groceries able to help their kids when that expired in august now you have the clock ticking because there's no help in september october november and and by the way that was at the beginning of august too um november and now december four months later and so it's is it any surprise at all that people are behind four months on rent and that that is completely normal. That is, I mean, it's not normal, but it is very common, I should say, that people are four, five months behind plus on rent. Oh, and by the way, if you were experiencing issues with unemployment before the pandemic, or if you were struggling with your rent before the pandemic, we're acting as though you're in a different situation, right? As though you're not in this boat with us, as though, if you were struggling with your bills before the pandemic started, that the pandemic doesn't affect you at all, right? That you are like responsible for this, which is also wrong. 
which is also completely wrong and false. And the fact that so many people are disqualified from help because they were struggling shortly before the pandemic started or struggling before the pandemic started is just a complete rejection of reality. We are all enduring and all weathering this one way or another with more, with some people weathering it much, much harder than other people are weathering it. And so um, we really need to make sure that we get stimulus checks in. So the bad news is that the current package does not have stimulus checks. The good news is that we are starting to build bipartisan support for stimulus checks. So what that means is that while there are a whole lot of Republicans that are saying no on checks in UI, oh, and by the way, the White House, we have uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, Trump's uh, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. Now, when they see all this pushback with people needing checks, now what their new proposals is, is saying, you can get checks or UI. Which, is, which does not help the situation. We should not erase unemployment so that people could get checks and we should not erase checks so that people get unemployment, which by the way, the unemployment package that they're already proposing is already too little. Um, but no matter, we need to make sure that even if we take this, even if we take this deal, right? Because I, I'm actually like not this, um, I know Fox News and not even just Fox News, like plenty of other Democrats think I'm like this fire and brimstone, like my way or the highway, like blah, blah, blah kind of person. But the fact of the matter is I recognize that we need help and you all need help. And I will do whatever it takes in order to make sure that you all get the help that you need, get the money that you need, but also aren't sent in and made so vulnerable at your job that you get COVID and then have no recourse against your employer, right? That Because that trade-off's not worth it. And so, um, so what we're able to do is say, okay, listen, the $300 is, is not enough, but if that's as high as Trump is gonna go, if $300 in unemployment is the absolute highest that Republicans are gonna go, um, fine. Take this package, you know, let's, let's assess it but we need to add stimulus checks into it. And so the current state of play is that we've got this package. It's got some state and local funding, not enough. It's got unemployment assistance, not enough, but more. N not enough, but still something. In order for it this to, I think, push through is with no funny business, no fine print, no taking stuff away in order to, to get people's relief, is that you just add the stimulus checks in. And so I support this, but also what we're also seeing some movement in the Senate um, where uh, Republican Senator Josh Hawley is in support of it. And like, these are people that we never agree with, pretty much polar opposite on almost everything. Um, but both he and Bernie Sanders have introduced an amendment and we're speaking on the floor of the Senate um, to add stimulus checks. And so that's the state of play of things right now. Um, but the bottleneck is Mitch McConnell. The bottleneck is Mitch McConnell. And what we're also seeing is Steven Mnuchin with this proposal of exchanging one UI for another. And I never see this kind of austerity when it comes to Wall Street bailouts. I never see this kind of austerity when it comes to things that the absolute wealthiest people in our society demand. We only see this austerity. We don't even see this austerity mindset for the military, by the way. We are voting right now and have voted this year in committees and on the floor in advancing a $740 billion defense bill. 700 and Republicans have no problem with a $740 billion defense bill. Wave that baby through, but COVID checks, let's rein it back. Uh, unemployment, no. So this really isn't about fiscal responsibility at all. It's just not. It's about who's willing 
and who has the stomach to let people starve because they don't, I don't know, don't, aren't affected, have never been hungry. I have no idea. But the very fact that this is even partisan is sad. And we have to really make sure, you know, it, stimulus checks, it shouldn't be a Democratic thing and it shouldn't be a Republican thing. It should be a pandemic thing. It should be a national disaster thing. Um, it should be an emergency thing. And, you know, it's, it's sad that this is partisan. What I'm looking at right now is what can we pass that that can at least float people through until inauguration day on January 20th and maybe a little bit after to so that Biden can take over and maybe we can get a little bit more traction. And frankly, if we win these races in Georgia, we'll be able to get people COVID relief without the funny business. We win in Georgia, we can help transition this country to a $15 minimum wage. We can make sure that we expand people's access to health care. We can make sure that that we get a stimulus check and that we get a COVID response that is not just like a stimulus check once a year and then we pretend that no one else has a problem for it, but that it's consistent, that it's science informed, and that we at least have a chance to actually organize for changes that center working people. And I'm not here to kind of give you all the promises and say, oh, you know, Democrats are amazing. And if you just elect them, they'll be good. No, it's not like that either. You know, there's a lot of uh, like our elections are not set it and forget it is what I'll say. And especially when we have a large influence in lawmaking of, you know, m more conservative um, folks, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, you're still going to have to fight for working people, um, especially because lobbyists haven't gone anywhere. And lobbyists don't care what party you are. Um, special interests don't care what party you are. They just show up for whoever has the majority at that time. And that's why everyday people need to stay organized. And when they call you radical, I mean, it's really sad what gets called radical um, these days. You know, I get called radical because I think healthcare is a human right in the United States when Canada has a universal healthcare system and when Europe has, you know, many countries in Europe have decided, hey, we're going to be an advanced society and not let people die in the street because insulin is too expensive or because we've decided to allow insulin to be too expensive. That's what, so, you know, not being, demanding that we don't allow conditions where people are too poor to live is what gets passed off as the radical far left um, in the United States. So just know that there's just a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of it is propaganda, right? Like, it, it's just, the, the fact that so many of us have been indoctrinated into thinking that it's radical far left, that people can be murdered in the street by, you know, by, by police officers and there'll be no accountability and that we, we shouldn't even expect an indictment or an investigation that is thorough or anything like that, that we've like expected miscarriage of justice, you're radical far left. You're radical far left if you think there should be real accountability there. Not just like banning a chokehold here, but that people should go to jail for intentionally where we see are killing other people negligently. Um, or what ha or you know what have you. Um, remedial things beyond that. You know, I know there's, I, I, I try to read <laughs> in, uh, in, you know, abolitionist work and I always struggle um, with, with those frameworks as well because we've all been kind of indoctrinated um, to think about like what is radical or too far. But meanwhile, the reality that we are living in right now is radical. Like we are living in this, rea in this radical reality of conservatism and 
this radical, you know, conservative and corporate norm. And, um, and that's what's radical, you know, letting people die because they can't afford insulin when the original patent for insulin was a dollar, that's radical. That's radical to me. That's destructive radicalism to me. Having a global pandemic and choosing to not cover people's health care, that's radical to me. That's radically wrong to me. Um, paying people $7 an hour when not a single person who's who can really afford to live in a home on that on 40 hours on a full-time job seven hours a week and you don't have help from mom or dad or you know whatever and you didn't inherit the home that you live in like paying seven dollars an hour in the richest country in the world which is not enough for people to eat sleep safely that's radical to me that's radical so you're not radical if you believe in a living wage you're not radical if you believe that health care is a human right and that we should guarantee it to everybody and i'm not talking about health insurance let me make that very clear i'm talking about health care i'm not talking about you should have the right to pay for a frankly I'm trying not to curse. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm not saying you should have the right to pay for a raggedy bronze plan that doesn't cover the health care that you need. I'm talking about you should be able to walk into a doctor with your health concern, get treatment, get a diagnosis, and not be scared that you're going to have to mortgage your life or choose between rent and medicine. So you're not radical if you believe that that's something that we should have as a modern society. It's not even like we're trying to go to space in the 1960s, right? It. I wish that we could have this like, you know, this, this mentality that, and this pride that people have. I wish that that you know that the united states is cutting edge and number one in everything that we do everything in a way that no other country has done before i'm just trying to catch up to some civilized other societies that actually care for each other you know we're not even trying to be the first to guarantee healthcare in their country. We're not even trying to say the United States is super ambitious and we should establish the first, you know, guaranteed healthcare policy in the world. No, we're already behind. We're already behind. And we need to catch up to the rest of the world. And if we want to take pride in leading the pack, then that means we need to lead the pack. And leading the pack means Medicare for all. It means vision, dental, physical, and mental health care that you can go in and, and not have a problem. Walk in, say, this is the help that I need. You get a diagnosis. You're able to get that assistance. And when people say, oh, my gosh, like, you have to think about how people wait in in other countries. First of all, many of those claims are very over exaggerated. But second of all, second of all, how long do you wait to go to the doctor because you don't think you can afford it? How many of you all have waited five years to go to the dentist because you're scared that it's gonna cost $2,000 and you don't have $2,000? So our system is already a system where people self-select themselves into multi-year wait lists because they know they can't afford it. They know they can't afford getting that root canal or getting your, your tooth pulled that's hurting you, that it ends up costing more and more money the longer we wait because we can't afford it in the short, we can't afford the $500 in the short term, so we're gonna have to pay the $2,000 in the long term, right? That's a system that doesn't make sense. And by the way, a guaranteed healthcare system is cheaper than what we're doing right now cheaper than what we're doing right now. So anyways, um, shout out to my fellow radicals 
in the United States who believe crazy things like a full-time job should be enough for you to live and also, you know, believe in crazy radical things like if you kill someone, there shouldn't be impunity and um, also who believe really crazy radical things like you should get a stimulus check without having to bail out a corporation for it or that you should get a stimulus check without your employer, um, you know, if you work for one of these huge conglomerate employers sending you into harm's way and being completely immune from any accountability for that. You know, shout out to my fellow radicals who think that, you know, we should live in a humane, advanced society um, and that we shouldn't be under the thumb of a $7 minimum wage and, you know, racist systems because I don't know, because that just benefits whoever the people are in power to already be in power. So, you know, shout out to my radicals who think that maybe one way that we can deal with a lot of the shortfall that we have is to do things like legalize marijuana and tax the, the commerce on that so that we can fund our schools. Or I don't know, tax the rich. Maybe we can tax the rich so that people who have helipads on their house or near their house can help chip in for black school districts that are perpetually underfunded. How about we do that? But apparently if you believe in that, you are radical, far left, danger to this country. Both parties will disassociate with you, right? Um, but if you are a Republican um, member of Congress, who signs on to an amicus brief to overturn the results of our national election, which 106 House Republicans did, not just challenge a precinct, not just challenge a state, but challenge many states. Just challenge the results of an election, actually undermine our Democrat, our dem like, I don't even want to say Democrat, big D Democrat, our democracy. If you want to undermine our democracy so that you can advance minority rule in the United States because um, black and brown people not voting for you is too politically inconvenient to your hold on power, you're just a moderate Republican, right? You're just a normal Republican. You want to undermine the very democracy that we claim makes us special and gives us moral authority to have you know disastrous foreign policy you want to undermine that democracy and you'll sign on to amicus briefs to overturn the results of our presidential election that makes you a moderate republican but if you want to get people stimulus checks and if you want to guarantee health care in the united states that apparently makes you a radical dangerous leftist you know, I didn't grow up like many of you. I did not grow up in a far left household or a far right household. I didn't grow up in a house like that. I grew up in a house that was actually proudly independent. I grew up in a house that said, you need to be watching all these people because none of these people <laughs> can be trusted to consistently deliver maximally for you. And so you need to keep your eyes out and actually look and read and see what's happening. That's the house that I grew up into. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are like team red or team blue. And in our two party system, for the most part, if you want to be a, a public servant in elected office and you're not kind of running on, on a local level, we have to choose team red or team blue, um, because we don't have a parliamentary system like we ha like there are in other countries. In other countries, there are many different parties and you elect who you think is best for your pocket of the world. And that may result in one party getting 10%, another party getting 20%, another party getting 30%. And then what they have to do is that they have to cobble together like these two or three or four party, whatever it may be, have to form a coalition that says, that says we're gonna be the majority, we're gonna be the government, right? Which almost forces people to see and, and discuss the more nuanced differences. And everyday people can understand that. But if you're just team red or team blue, 
you know, people just make claims about what they are and what they support and what they don't support and whether they support it or not support it, there's less accountability for it. So anyways, that's just a big rant because, I mean, if people think that the present day is like radical far left, they just haven't even opened a book. Like we had much, much more radical um, and radicalism in the United States as recently as the 60s, you know? As recently, you know, when we talk about how labor unions started in this country, I mean, that was radical. People died. People died in this country. It was almost like a war for the 40-hour work week and your weekends. And um, a lot of people died for these very basic economic rights. And uh, we can't go back. We can't go back to that time. And so I guess the thing that is, you know, sad is that when you see people that indulge both on the right and the left, both Democrats and Republicans, when they indulge in these narratives of common sense policies being radical, what it does, what they're trying to do is really shorten the window of what's possible. Doubling the minimum wage should be normal. Um, Guaranteed health care should be normal. Trying to save our planet should be centrist politics. And, you know, I'm happy, I'd be happy to sacrifice, you know, my reputation if people were calling me a sellout for believing in guaranteed health care, right? If, if that left was much more expansionary. But the fact of the matter is, is that this stuff should be common sense. And um, we have way too many people, you know, our perception of what's radical, our perception of being able to shut down when we get past a trigger, right? Because here's the thing that's also a huge irony to me is that all these Republicans and all of these folks who were anti-shutdown are the same people who weren't wearing masks who forced us to shut down in the first place. Shutdowns are not an inevitability. It's not something that we want to do. It's not something that anybody wants to do. I want to see my family. I haven't seen my family in a year, like many of you all. I want to. I want to be able to visit my friends without being scared, and I want to be able to hang out with my friends when it's cold outside, and not have to be outside. You know, all of that. Nobody wants a shutdown, but the same people who are now like, oh, anti-shutdown, we can't shut down, like blah, 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 were the same people who weren't wearing masks, who forced the caseloads to be so high that we had to uh, shut down areas to begin with. So if you're anti-shutdown, you better to have been wearing a mask all damn year, because don't come to me and say you're anti-shutdown when you're spreading COVID all over the place, potentially. And so... I don't just say that about everyday people, but our elected officials, because you all, you know, for the science and for the studies and for everything to reach mass understanding for for just the public, that takes a while. But as elected officials, our job is to be first in modeling responsible behavior, the first. That's our job. And because I can't ask you to wear a mask if I'm not wearing a mask. I can't ask you to take a vaccine if I'm not willing to take a vaccine. I can't ask, demand that like, you know, I can't ask for you to endure without a stimulus check or without, you know, UI if I'm not willing to understand reality without that, you know, to really fully acknowledge that. And so I just, you know, I was supposed to do a quick update <laughs> and then do your Q&A, but I wanted to let you all know what the status of things are. So, is. so, you know, in conclusion, 
There's a lot of BS fighting. And there's a $900 billion package on the table. It has $300 in additional unemployment insurance for you. It's got a bunch of other things, but I want to tell you the things that you're gonna feel, right? So it's got state and local funding. What does that mean? When we have these shutdowns, um, so the federal government does not, you know, in terms of our, our spending and how, when people say, how do you pay for it? Federal government doesn't really work like a piggy bank or like a household where you have to budget and like every dollar in is what comes out. And if you don't get that dollar in right away, you can't spend it. That's not how the federal government financing works. But states and municipalities, cities and states do rely on that taxes, on, on those kinds of taxes and that kind of income. So when we grind economies to a halt, all that sales tax, small businesses that we really need a lot of help for. Uh, we need rent relief for small businesses. We need payment relief for small businesses. We need payroll relief for small businesses too. You know, all of that as well. Um, rent support, people who um, are on the cusp of eviction or have been evicted, we need to make sure that we take care of, of you all as well. But any, anyways, states and localities, when we shut down states and localities, sales tax isn't getting exchanged the same way, like all that stuff isn't really happening. And so states need to pay their teachers, we need to pay for our schools, we need to pay for garbage collection. So if you're in New York City, you may notice that some things are starting to be shaky, right? Like garbage collection happens a little less frequently because we can't pay for it to happen more frequently, right? So this COVID package, what we're trying to get is state and local funding because since the federal government doesn't work in that same way, since the federal government has a lot more uh, financial and monetary tools at their assistance, many more than, um, than states do or municipalities do, what we can do, one part of this COVID package is to get states and localities money so that they can keep paying their police, their, their police officers, you know, all of this whole thing. People are talking about defund, right? Everyone's talking about defund. Um, you wanna know who's actually voting defund the police? Republicans. Because Republicans are trying to block state and local funding so that those budgets dry up. Where do they think that these police budgets come from? So if you wanna complain about defunding police, go talk to a Republican, first of all. But, you know, I digress. Um, that state and local funding, it goes to teachers, it goes to firefighters, it goes to nurses, and yes, it also does go to police officers in the short term. Now, what we also see, so that state and local funding is like all, the, it goes to your garbage collection, literally anybody that is employed by your state or your municipality, any service that you rely on, any of it goes to state and local funding. So that first part of that package is to keep your state, whether it's a red state or a blue state above water so that we can at least operate normally for a short period of time as we navigate other transitions financially, right? Then the second thing is unemployment insurance. So this has $300 in unemployment um, assistance. The third thing is that there's hag there is haggling over this corporate immunity, right? There's some corporate immunity, Mitch McConnell's going like, all out, we want five years, no lawsuits. I do think that some people are trying to walk off that ledge and do something smaller. We'll see what the more specific language on that is. Um, but it's got $300 in UI. We need stimulus checks. We need to add stimulus checks. So state of play is that that's the current package. The current package has $300 in additional UI. It's got state and local funding. It's got a bunch of other things. Um, it does not have stimulus checks. So right now, members of the Senate and we're in the House and we do have bipartisan support to try to add stimulus checks in there. Um, we even believe that Trump wants stimulus checks. But so we're getting resistance, not from the entire Republican Party, but from pockets of the Republican Party. And so that's the state of play. Hopefully we will be back um, next week. Congress will be back next week and we're really kind of coming close on some of these deadlines. And so I'm hoping that we get answers by next week. 
on what's going on. Um, but that's kind of the current state of play. Um, and I'll take some questions for you all right now. Um, pulling up some questions for you all. Let's see. Someone said, what can we do to help push for canceling student loans? So one big thing that we can do, um, see, I'm, I'm supposed to be cooking and I'm like getting way too wrapped up with you all. Um, one thing that we can really do, let me also get some pasta on the stove too. Um, I don't know if you all can hear me, but one thing that we can do on student loans is, uh, and I don't know if, I'm, if this is too loud, but one thing that we can really do on student loans is that we really need broad-based advocacy. So here's the deal, like what we're hearing is that, it. so first of all, it is possible for a president to use executive action to try to cancel student debt. The clearest path is canceling federal student debt because the federal government holds it, right? We hold that student debt, so we have a lot more flexibility in what we're able to do with it. You, there is also flexibility on private student loans too, right? We can buy private, the government could, could buy private student loans um, potentially. And, but you know, a lot of people will argue about that, this, that, and the other. I think that there's possibilities in both, both directions. Um, but I also believe that, um, and we know that, uh, that the president can wipe out student loan debt with executive order. And the thing that I find frustrating is that, you know, when people are like, oh, like, do we really want to do that? And is it going too far? And this, that, and the other, we have to understand Donald Trump has just ripped apart so much progress by executive order. And what we're dealing with is a right that is willing to stretch and, and do unusual things in order to execute on their agenda. And then the moment we get in power, if we are too scared about and too preoccupied with like norms, you know, so much so that it keeps us from actually changing people's lives, then who is that norm serving, really? And if that norm is not serving people, then maybe we should change the norm. And maybe the norm should be that we actually have the power to help people. Maybe that's what the norm should be. And so we do have the ability. It is there. But once again, there's this frame that if you don't think that people should be in debt for life, for going to and getting a secondary education, you're radical, right? Like that's, and that's the thing is that people act as though like I frame myself this way. No, our established, you know, our, our established meant our our media, like all of these things, frames all of these common sense policies as radical. Um, and I also don't think that there that it's a coincidence that I'm young, I'm brown, and I'm a woman that adds to the ease of applying antagonism to that narrative, right? Like if I was like a clean cut white dude saying we should cancel student loan relief, it would be seen as like automatically more normal. Um, but I so I do feel like a lot of this narrative is racialized or class if I do because the people who are demanding these changes tend to be working class, they tend to be working class, middle class, um, black and brown, women, people, you know, just everybody. 
And, uh, but if you aren't like part of this like elite cocktail club unit, then like you are, I don't know, you're, you're having these demands for bold visionary action uh, from Democrats. It's like seen as radical. So anyways, it's possible. The thing is, is that we have to normalize it, which means that, you know, if your parents are like moderate Democrats, maybe you can talk to them about why this isn't crazy. Um, because frankly, a lot of the things that um, that folks call radical now um, in both parties are things that, you know, older generations of both parties enjoyed when they were growing up. Because college was almost, was practically free for, you know, people's parents and grandparents growing up. College was practically free for them. Um, and if they paid anything, it was like, Papitas, very little. Um, certainly not lifetime debt loads of money. Um, and, and so the things that people call radical today are the same things that they enjoyed when they were growing up. The things that gave them a chance when they were growing up. You know, we, when, people talk about, when people talk about a wealth tax as being super radical, we had one. We had a very aggressive wealth tax that was championed by Republicans. And so this erosion of norms, I think is like very much coincides with this, frankly, it is, it's like this diminishment of power of working people in our democracy and a real takeover of industry. Um, and I feel like a lot of companies and corporations, they get worried about there being like so much hostility right now. And what they're deeming as hostility is literally people just trying to have any semblance of the economic rights that they had 50 years ago. But because folks in, in with that degree of concentrated power um, are so used to it, anything that almost feels like a, a, an unequivocal movement towards working people is seen as like some drastic threat. And it's not, you know, and, and here's the thing is, is that we have to also assess the dangers of the path that we're on. And I'm talking about like, even when you forget about Trump, even if you rewind to before Trump, we were still on a calamitous path of income inequality. We were on a calamitous path of bailing out Wall Street and doing all of these things. And it's not a partisan thing. This is about the concentration of wealth and power in America. And, um, and when you have that concentration of power among a tiny sliver of people, and you're leaving the majority of people to starve, be evicted, or just having to work two, three jobs to survive, you, it's creating an unstable social situation, an unstable society, a society that has more homes than homeless people, more empty homes than, than people who are experiencing homeless is an unstable society. A society who that disincentivizes the education of its own populace by creating mountains of debt at the prospect of having a more educated, you know, people is a dysfunctioning and disordered society. And so we, if we actually want to create some semblance of peace in our country, we have to break from our norm because the accepted norm is acceptance of widespread poverty and insecurity and people feeling like they have to choose between medicine and groceries in the wealthiest country in the world. What good, what use is being the wealthiest country in the world if people can't even afford to live, right? You don't have to be the wealthiest country in the world in order to make sure that people have health care. And we know this because other countries that are not the wealthiest country in the world do this. And so if we are going to be the wealthiest society in human history and love it and revel in it, 
then that money better be going to something good. Because if it's going to bailing out billionaires and and people with 10 helipads and you know whatever like them leaving their inheritance for their so their cat can have a butler then what use is it i would much rather live in a society that where people don't have to worry about being homeless or people don't have to worry about their medical debt being what gets you know what what makes them homeless people feeling like they actually have power in their job and in their work um, and that you won't be fired for asserting your rights and not wanting to be, you know, harassed or discriminated against. Oh, and by the way, the other thing that's radical, apparently, is, um, is not having amnesia about the history of our country. That's also apparently super radical. Um, and what's normal is forgetting about our past, even our most immediate and recent past. Like I'm, I laugh so much at these people who are like, defund the police is too complicated. Um, people don't understand it. Uh, we need to pick something simple. Like, you know, when Black Lives Matter came out, everyone knew what that means. Are you kidding me? Like when BLM came out, they also faced all the same critiques that folks who want to, you know, rein in out of control police budgets so that they can fund their schools are dealing with. People said Black Lives Matter is confusing. You know, what about all lives? It's very isolating. Like, you know, you aren't going to get people on your side. There was a time when no Democratic politician or very few, very few were willing to say Black Lives Matter. There was a time, there was a time when it was not seen as, it was seen as like too radical and too confusing and too polarizing. And the fact that people have already forgotten that and that was just five minutes ago, you know, I mean, to think about are actual and actually ask people to reflect and, and acknowledge the immense just racial apartheid that the United States had and, and has had in many different ways and how that impacts to yes, the present day, including the electoral college and some of the very you know underlying structures of the Senate, like the filibuster. I mean, you know, it, some folks may think that's too much to ask of, of everyone, but I don't think it's too much to ask of our elected officials. But anyways, um, COVID, we're hoping on getting this checked. If you wanna cancel your student loans, you gotta make sure that we have to put on, here's the thing, you have to cross that line and realize that political parties are not fan clubs and you don't just cheer on whoever's in, in charge because if you're not willing to engage in constructive, constructive critique, protest, uh, petitioning, etc. If you're not willing to engage in that, it's never going to happen. That's why, like, politics is not a fan club, right? And I, you know, it's just not. And the moment that anyone like thinks that they're going to support any party or any person, no matter what they do is the moment that we realize that, you know, that you're contributing to, to real problems. So you have to demand it. And you need to demand student loan debt just as strongly from a Democratic administration as you would a Republican administration, period. Because there is something to be said about hypocrisy, where if you're only going to bring energy around policy demands when a Republican is in charge and say those things towards them, but you're not willing to bring those same policy demands with that same energy when a Democrat is in charge, then like, are we really in this to change the world or are we just in this to like pick a fan club, right? And so we have to continue on the organizing and we have to continue on the pressure. And um, guess what? People are gonna fight back because people don't like, you know, elected officials don't like being criticized. It's just, you know, it is what it is. Um, and so there's always going to be that, like that pushback, 
Um, but we have to say, you know, we support, we supported you and, and say why you support, say why you voted for somebody. You need to be really vocal about that. You know, if you voted for a Democrat so that Democrats could cancel your student debt, say that. If you voted for, for you know, a Democrat so that we could, at the very least, lower Medicare, the age of qualification of Medicare, a dramatic amount, say that. If, like, why did you vote? You know, and this is why it's so important to vote for something and not just vote against something, right? If you voted because you want to see climate action and you want to make sure we stop poisoning ourselves, say that, say that. And so we have to say that. We have to remind ourselves what we're trying to accomplish because this is not just a game of personalities and like, let's just, you know, puff people up unsubstantively, right? We have to make sure that we are always talking about the issues. What do we want? And so I'm here to tell you that canceling student loan debt is possible and don't let people get away with telling you that it's not. It is. In fact, I think I think student loan debt cancellation is, is probably one of the most possible things um, that we can do up front. So we have to demand it and we have to, um, to organize around it. So aside from that, it's getting a little late. All I did was, I don't know, shave a lemon. I forget what they call this. <laughs> but um, so I really got to actually cook. Sorry. Sorry I didn't actually make a meal for you all, but I will try to make up for it. Um, because all I did was put water in a pot and shave a lemon. But um, I will make up for it by posting a photo of this meal when I'm to my stories when I'm actually done doing it. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>